In the first game, we discussed bishops and pawns by taking a look at a very, very old game between Alexander Macdonald and Charles Louis de La Bourdonnais. Now, we're going to move on to rooks, knights, and queens. And in order to cover this material, we're going to look at two games, or more specifically, certain moments from two games. The first one is a game played between the world champion, former world champion, Mihail Tal, and a player who at the time was one of the best in the world, Paul Kerish. So we'll be taking a look at that game first, and then afterwards we're going to look at a game played between a young Magnus Carlsen, and then very young Magnus Carlsen, I should say, and uh, Vladimir Kramnik. And we hope to learn from these two games the most important aspects of optimizing your queen, your knights, and your rooks. So here in the game between Mihail Tal and Paul Kerish, we are going to fast forward up to this moment right here on move 11. White has just played the move knight to a4, and black drops the bishop back to b6. Now, white captures, and here black recaptures with the pawn. Well, we can see that there are some doubled pawns here on b7 and b6, which is generally not ideal, but black actually could not avoid this, because if he had captured with, say, the queen, then after bishop takes f6, g takes f6, he would nevertheless end up with doubled pawns. And so there are two reasons why black is much happier to accept the doubled pawns here, on the queen side, than on the king side here. The first and the biggest reason is king safety. We see that the king here on g8 is now going to be less uh, sheltered. I know that I said that in these two games we were going to be focusing on knights, queens, and rooks, and that's true. But to talk about king optimization, I think just for a moment, we can split it into two broad categories. In the beginning of the game and in the middle game, we are concerned with keeping our king as safe as possible, almost always. And the only change, a very big change later on in the game, is that as pieces come off the board, as we move towards an end game, the king suddenly becomes a fighting piece. It can often in king and pawn end games, for example, or uh, king and rook and pawn end games, those end games can often be decided by whose king is more active. But until that moment arrives, we're just focused on the king being safe. So we will encounter this on a few occasions over the course of these two games, this particular aspect of optimizing the king, which is, you know, as simple as just keeping it safe. Okay, so therefore after knight takes b6, we see that black plays a takes b6. Now normally, you look at these two pawns and you say that's quite bad, but on the other hand, a subtle benefit of having doubled pawns is that one side gets a semi-open file. So here we see rooks thrive on semi-open files, especially the side that does not have the pawn, right? So we can say that this is, of course, a semi-open file that cuts both ways, but the truth is that it really only cuts one way. This pawn on a2 is being defended by the rook on a1, and if he were to, let's say, leave his post, then black would snap it up. The same cannot be said to hold true for the rook on a8. If it leaves, there will be no consequences. So this is the first thing to keep in mind. You want to put rooks on either open or semi-open files, and a semi-open file favors the side that does not have a pawn. Now, white's next move is knight to d4. What I want to say about this move is that white's knight is very happy here, and the reason is because knights are looking for two things more than anything. They want to be centralized. A knight, for example, if it were fianchettoed, like a bishop, would generally be a quite awful piece. One of the reasons for this is that the knight is 
a very short range piece indeed, the main reason. So if we draw arrows here, pointing to the squares that a knight on g2 could potentially jump to, we see very quickly that it's far from ideal. And if we were to, let's say, drag this knight over to h1, then that knight would only have two squares, a very, very tiny range of scope. Whereas a bishop on g2, on the other hand, is in fact on its longest possible diagonal and can be a hugely influential piece. So therefore we want knights that are either central or somewhat advanced. For example, a knight on d4 can potentially jump to f5 and that's generally considered a very, very nice square for a knight. Or similarly, if it directs towards the queen side, it can go to b5. So that's the first thing, centralization. But the second aspect, which is just as important, is stability. Notice this knight here on d4 is quite a happy knight because it's pretty stable. Think about what can kick it out. A black pawn? Well, in theory, yes, but in practice here, there are no black pawns. After losing both the c and the e pawns, black faces the price that this knight cannot be kicked out by force. And on top of that, remember what white just grabbed here on b6. After knight a4, bishop b6, knight takes, and a takes b6, it was that bishop that was lost. And that bishop is a bishop that could have destabilized the knight here on d4. So we see that the knight on d4, in the absence of a dark squared bishop for black, and in the absence of c and e pawns, is a very, very stable piece indeed. Now, let's move on to the next moment of the game that I'd like to comment on. So we fast forward a few moves. And here, black plays the move rook f to e8. So what I want to remark on is notice these two rooks. We can see that there is one semi-open file here and a second semi-open file in his favor. In the meantime, we can say that white has one semi-open file in his favor, and then there is an open file that can work in either player's favor. Notice how black may at some point soon decide to focus on this open file, but he is not looking to play passively and defending so let's say his d-pawn. Instead, he's going on the offensive and using that semi-open e-file to try and pressure the white position. Notice that if white does absolutely nothing, let's say king moves, then the black thread is seen. Knight takes d4, queen takes d4, and rook takes e2. An immediate consequence of blacks posting his rook on that semi-open e-file. So how does white react against this move? Well, he plays rook f to e1. And in fact, maybe this was a little bit too passive. Notice again that the side that has no pawn on that semi-open file ends up with the active rook. And the side with the pawn typically will end up with the passive rook. Let's get to the next moment here. Black plays this move rook to e4. Notice how this central and stable knight is really upsetting to black. And so he launches the rook forward to e4 just to try and undermine that knight's stability. Remember, centralization and stability. White is forced to vacate that square. And now the next important moment, rook a to e8. We see that one of the most powerful things that you can do to optimize your rooks is to connect them. Now, here already in this position, the rooks were connected. What is meant by this? Well, one rook is looking at the other rook and the other rook is also eyeing up that rook, right? And so they can be said to be connected. This is one of the big advantages of castling. When you castle, your king starts here, the rook is on h8, the rook is on a8, you castle, suddenly 
that rook that was on h8, that's on f8. And that's suddenly connected with the rook on a8 if there are no other pieces blocking it, which often there will be. However, it's one thing to be connected along one's first rank, which is useful, but it's another thing to play rook e4, knight f3, and rook a8. Now you are connected, but you're connected along an e-file. So we say that this is rooks that are doubled up, and this increases their power substantially. Now, we fast forward a couple of moves, and black plays the move pawn to d4. And one of the things about this move is that it vacates the square on d5, and that's an important central square to vacate, because both this knight on f6 and the queen on d7 may seek to use it, since we haven't really spoken much about queens as yet in this game, but the number one thing that we need to keep in mind with the queen in terms of optimizing it is to centralize it. Because if you think about it, a queen is like a rook and a bishop combined. And so if you imagine a bishop on some square like d5, you can see that these are the longest diagonal and one of the longest diagonals. The h1 to a8 is the longest, and then the a2 to g8 is one of the second longer of the diagonals. And so a bishop there is very well placed, and a rook, well, it's also got a tremendous amount of scope. The real problem with having a rook somewhere like on d5 is that it can be quite easily targeted, in fact, by the likes of a bishop. But in terms of scope, that is a brilliant square for both a rook and a bishop. And so it makes sense that a queen would be very, very happy and very powerful on a central square. And we see this theme of queen centralization throughout this game and also the next. So let's keep an eye on that. After the next move, pawn to e3, black does indeed do that, queen to d5. And we see this x-ray on the king is a little bit of a concern for white. Pawn takes d4, and now rook takes d4. Now this is an important detail on both the rook as well as the queen. Rooks can be enhanced not only by connecting with other rooks like we saw here or like we saw earlier here, but also by setting up, forming a battery with the queen. And so here we see this queen incredibly powerful, assisting the rook on d4 to make this battery and also pinning this knight on f3 against the white king. This next position here, we see that black should do something about the very concrete threat of capturing this knight on e8. Now, black has three advances. He chooses the knight to d6, which makes sense. We would refer to this as the most principled move. The reason for this is that it is not only the more advanced of these squares versus when compared c7 and f6, we can see that it's more advanced than uh, c7 and equally advanced to f6, but it is also the more central of the squares, right? d6 is closer to an absolute pure central square than f6. And I mean, I think this is quite self-explanatory. And so in general, such a square is to be preferred. Now, we advance forward a few moves and we see that black establishes a relatively central knight. We can't always get knights on these four key central squares, but any square that is a little bit expanded from that point should also be considered as a decent choice. Notice, by the way, that he has actually achieved something by placing this knight on c4. He put so much pressure on the white position that a few moves later, white found himself with a bad pawn structure. And this bad pawn structure has a nasty effect on his king as well. We'll see that. Queen goes to e5. And here, we see the double attack. But black's queen remains on one of those central squares and, of course, combines very well with this particular rook, which is on b2 and on e3. Now white went knight to g2, surrendering the pawn on b2. You might be asking yourself, why did Tal allow this? 
Well, the problem is that if you were to play knight to d3, this would protect against the capture on e3 and defend on b2. But the black queen, notice it first arrived at d5, now going on to e5 and now on to e4. Centralized at all times, and here we're seeing very serious problems for this knight on d3. White here would go rook to d1. And now can you see the very strong black move here? Maybe I will flip the board for you guys to help you. Black to play, can you find the winning move? If you said knight to d4, you are absolutely correct. The knight here jumps into one of its central posts, central squares here. And it's extremely powerful move as it is threatening a check on f3 at the right moment. And of course, for now, the main threat is against this queen on e2. White's position is overloaded because, of course, he cannot capture the knight since the queen will fall. And therefore, it's game over. Let's flip things back now to seeing it from the white perspective. So instead, after queen e5, knight g2 happened. And now this is the next moment rook takes b2. The black rook reaches the seventh rank. This makes it a really especially powerful rook as white is in fact missing this pawn on f2. And that means that the rook's scope will hit even closer to the king here on g1. Now let's fast forward a few moves to see the next interesting moment. Here, black played the move rook to b3 once again coordinating that rook and the queen, this time crashing down on the point to b3 again, in a sense a, a type of queen rook battery. However, there was a more normal conventional battery missed by black. Queen to a2 was also a very, very strong option. And again, we see the power of rooks on the seventh rank. And of course, a queen being here is like just as powerful as two rooks and more, in fact, of course, because the queen is like a rook and bishop. Okay, so that was another good opportunity. Now, instead, rook b3, rook c3, rook takes c3, queen takes c3. This series of exchanges unfolded. And here, once again, black goes queen to e4. Notice how the black queen, a lot of the time, is staying within that extremely central position of the board. Of course, it avoids d4 since that is the one square well controlled by white. The next moment arises after the following sequence. In this position here, notice how the black knight can of course jump in and at some point it will intend to jump into the central squares. But for now, black wants to actually, you know, evict this knight from its direct, from its rather central location. It's just outside of that core of the center. And the thing about this knight is it's pretty stable. However, it is not perfectly stable because black is able to kick it out with a pawn move. Now you might be saying, but does this move not create a lot of weaknesses in the black camp? Such as, for example, the f6 square or the f5 square. And especially the f6 square right now, can we not see some ideas like knight d5 to f6? And that is true, but here is where we're going to talk a little bit about king safety. The thing is that white would like to bring that knight to d5. It's true that the knight here looks better, it is more centralized. However, it is not so stable because it doesn't have the support of any pawn or any minor piece indeed. It is only supported by the queen. Additionally, the knight here on d5 doesn't defend the king on f1. And so what we see is after a series of checks, we see that black can play this move here, king to g7. The move king g7 is a very, very nice move because it completely eliminates the possibility of check on f6 or check on e7. And as I highlighted already, look at 
all of these squares of the night jumps, there are a great majority of them that are simply not possible because black controls those squares. Now, jumps that are possible, such as b6, c7, and b4, are less attractive because they're over on the queen side, and of course we see that the main battle is happening in the center and king side. Therefore, we can see that even though centralized knights are something that tends to, you know, leave a knight quite optimized and we want to avoid that, we can see that sometimes you can invite it as long as you're able to take the sting out of it. And notice, additionally, you can take the sting out of it by simply removing the possible jumps. And additionally, you can exploit a knight like that when it is unstable. Notice how the white queen is tied down to the fence of this knight. And in the meantime, the king on g1 is very, very vulnerable in the absence of this defensive knight. Let's say if it were on e2, like in the game. And so this knight over here can threaten to jump on in and create mating threats against the white king in the near future. This is why white, after g5, had to correctly prioritize king safety over knight centralization and play the knight back to e2. So now let's move on to the next important instructive moment. Black played knight to e5, queen takes b7, knight to d3. The knight and the queen, by the way, are very, very powerful uh, duo when you are fighting against the white king. Now, here in this position, white gave the check on c8, and after king to g7, we see that now white truly has to deal with this threat on f2, and we also notice that as highlighted the queen and the knight here, look at the comparison between these two uncoordinated pieces and the black queen and knight instead. White played queen f5 to parry the threat, queen d2 threatening queen e1 check separating the king from the knight, the knight went to d4, check, king g2, and now queen e3. Here, the queen is both defending its own knight and attacking the white unstable central knight. White now went queen to d5, and with this move defending and creating a major threat. There is an old wisdom in chess, which is that to counter a knight, one should try to take away its jumps. And we've seen this throughout. Here, this jump, of course, is available, but not very interesting. This one is taken away. However, this jump is extremely interesting for white, and so black must have his eye on this at all times. However, he gets to strike first. He plays queen f2 check, king h3, and now queen f1 check. It's not possible for uh, white to block with the queen because knight f2 will be checkmate, and so the king must therefore go running. Knight f2 check. Notice throughout how the knight and the queen in the same way that a queen can set up a battery with the rook and a queen can set up a battery with the bishop, the queen can also combine forces with the knight, and it's very, very effective in chasing the enemy king. So here, the white king is forced to move further forward, and after a series of checks, we see that black succeeds in picking up this pawn on a3 with check, and the white king is forced to march all the way to the black queen side. The checks continue, and here, a move I, I want to remark on, the knight moves to e3. Notice how black's play has been truly excellent coordinating the pieces. The truth is that we could sit here all day long talking about how to optimize your pieces, but, you know, on a chessboard, the pieces are all interacting, they're cooperating with each other, and so no discussion of optimization can ever be complete without paying a lot of regard to how well coordinated your total army is, so always keep that in mind. Now here the knight is defended by the black queen, while simultaneously attacking the white queen and covering that weakness on f5 for the white knight. The queen is of course forced out of the most central squares because the 
squares other than d4 are all controlled by the black pieces. After queen b5, the second that the queen vacates, queen e4. Centralizing the queen and also going after the unstable white central knight. Queen to b2, of course, now there are threats against the enemy king, so king g6. Queen b6 check, f6, knight e6. And now notice how white himself is trying to activate his pieces and perhaps be able to create some kind of threats against the black king. Now, the next move by black knight to c4 targets the white queen. And after queen a6, now goes knight to e5. And here, the knight on e5 is fantastically well placed. It's central. Notice, by the way, how no longer is it so interesting to black to have that knight on e3. The knight on e3 was extremely threatening when the white king was on the white king side. So, however, now that the white king is all the way over on c8, the black knight is much happier to be on e5, and additional to this, as mentioned, it's defended. White now goes with his knight to c7, and this reduces the strength of the knight, but unfortunately, white did not have much choice because queen c6 check was a real danger. After knight c7, white has been forced to disimprove his knight and been forced to drag his king all the way over to the queen side. And this was the direct result of black's superiority of both knight, especially knight, and also of his queen. And we see this nice, I won't say final picture, but near final picture of both of black's pieces in the center and also helping in no small part to defend the king. After queen c2, queen d6, black simply collected another pawn and well, Mikhail Tal kept on fighting for a few more moves, but eventually he was forced to resign. So I hope that you found this game instructive. And now I'm going to show you a game between Vladimir Kramnik and a young Magnus Carlsen that will hopefully cement some of the talking points of this game. So I'll see you there.